Welcome everyone to Senate Education this Thursday, April 18th at 2.10 in the afternoon. Just got off the floor a few minutes ago. Before we move on, we'll uh, to talk to the State Board at 2.30. Um, we are going to kick things off with Emily Simmons, General Counsel, Agency of Education. And these are your thoughts on the BOCES bill. Ms. Simmons, don't feel obliged to rush through because we were fine looping back to you uh, on this later today if it works for you. But for now, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me in. Um, I heard loud and clear in your prior meetings that you really wanted markup because this is getting to late days for this bill. So we can um, go right to the two. I'm only marking up two sections for you today. Do you have, okay, it looks like you have my written three. testimony. Okay. So here's, um, can I bring you up to the theme of what you're hearing from me today and the justification? You're looking at markup that really just changes dates and pushes okay. them back along with, um, in line with our best thinking. And I think you've also heard the Vermont Superintendents Association mention maybe pushing back dates. So I don't think it's only the agency um, coming from this angle. So you've heard from Cassandra Ryan and Ann Bordnaro and Secre um, Deputy Secretary Boucher about some of our thinking of how BOCES could be complicated, especially when it comes to some uses of federal funds that we think they will want to leverage. Some of the uses of federal funds that'd be a, a good um, use of a BOCES structure. So we're coming from a place of, you know, we don't really have a change to the bill itself. We need some time to plan toward and um, a really away from some challenges that we're worried we'd encounter and just put out some thoughtful guidance to the field, be ready to answer their questions as they come up. We also noticed that there is um, some thinking in the building about um, a process of taking a broader look at Vermont's education system that's in a bill in the other body, H887. So pushing BOCES back one year would also allow for consideration of BOCES as an option, but not yet a reality in the context of that land work. And then finally, it would give us a chance after looking into any technical issues to come back to the General Assembly next session and ask for a fix before things really go live. So if you want me to jump right into my date um, suggestions, the main issue is that the effective date in the House Pass version is uh, July 1 of this year. So that means that a BOCES could form at any point after July 1st. That's mostly what concerns the agency. We want some time to get out ahead of this activity and be a partner to the field in planning and support any planning before these go live. So we are um, suggesting that the date by which each, each supervisory union must vote yes or no on initially jo jo joining, excuse me, a BOCE would be not July 1, 26, but July 1, 27, meaning that in that same paragraph, the date that is a deadline to hold the organizational meeting for the first round of BOCES becomes July 1, 28. And then in paragraph B, we're proposing to leave those reporting dates for the agency the same. Really what the bill is asking us to do is look at progress in that first round of activity and give you a report. That activity will be over in time with our proposed dates for us to keep the report dates the same. Then going to the appropriation, we've adjusted the formed after date in line with our recommendation for you know, when can, when is a BOCE permitted to start to form? We're suggesting July 1, 2025. All other elements of the appropriation, I think, can stay the same. Again, we're flexible on that. I think Beth um, will have some thoughts for me if need be on the mechanics of the appropriation. And then the effective date for the elements other than the appropriation would be out one year, July 1, 2025.
committee. Senator Weeks. So thank you, Ms. Simmons. Uh, I'm wondering if you can uh, characterize whether AOE supports H887 section one or H630. Uh, they seem to have, they seem to be kind of not coming to the same uh, conclusion. And they're, so they're, they're, they're different. They're picking maybe a similar uh, goal, but they're approaching it differently. I'm wondering if AOE has a position. And, and just so everyone knows, uh, H887, you're talking about the yield bill right. that's in our folders. We, we haven't had a careful walkthrough of it, but we did have an overview. And we know that we've asked the chair uh, and vice chair of house education to let us know when it's baked. In other words, they really feel like it's there. They are, I know, anticipating a bunch of amendments in house approves and floor. So uh, I just sort of put that out just as a reminder to the committee and everything. But still, the question is, is a good one. Uh, just wanted to bring everybody back to that discussion yesterday. Ms. Simmons. So I'm not able to speak to the yield bill. I've not been our point person following that. Although I I think I'm ready to push back and say, I, I don't think that they're at cross purposes. So in our view, BOCES is a new government structure that would permit some supervisory unions who think it would be advantageous to pool their efforts on projects to be defined by by that group of supervisory unions. This is um, similar to existing law I know you've heard about that allows joint contracts among supervisory unions. So you know to get economies of scale, or to share administrative tasks, often supervisory unions will work together um, to accomplish their work. Right. The big difference in BOCES advantage that I see in BOCES that doesn't exist in law now is now under a joint, con a joint contract framework, one supervisory union has to retain the job of being the fiscal agent um, basically keep the bank account and they can't ever truly pool that responsibility and it makes things complicated for their partnerships and that one supervisory union is really the owner of the fiscal work and the others pay back reimburse contribute to that fiscal work in a BOCES you smooth out that fiscal wrinkle and they are able to pool their resources for the work they've identified Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, any questions uh, for Ms. Simmons, who again is representing the agency on this issue? Uh, any questions? Any concerns? But moving in this direction, please, Senator Machine. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the testimony. Uh, I think this is just a comment. Um, I don't agree with pushing out the dates. Uh, I don't think that going to take SU's um, you know, three years to figure out how to come together and vote. Uh, and I, I mean, this with the, at least what I'm reading here, you know, this would be implemented in 2027 and the proposal is to have it in 2028. Right. I, I feel like four years to figure out compliance with federal grants, fiscal compliance isn't like, I, I get that it's complex, but I don't think it's four years of research complex. Um, and this is a change that I feel is needed yesterday, uh, considering how how much our SUs and our schools in general are struggling uh, to figure out logistics and administration of different contracts and work that we're trying to do. So I would vote no on the new language. Any of those states? No on all of them or anything. Okay, I would say no on all of them. Okay. Uh, everyone else, where oh, are I just also eight. Yeah, Sarah, do it, please. Um, I guess I'm I'm a little torn on both of these in general. This this notion um, for a couple of reasons. One, it seems as though it's already happening. So I'm, I'm just wondering if we need it in statute. I know that they're doing this kind of work 
at least I've heard they're doing this kind of work in, um, is it Windsor County? I think in Windsor County where they're- uh, uh, A represent bus may have mentioned something yeah, like yeah. that. So yeah, they're correct. sharing resources. Okay. They're already doing it. Um, um, what else am I, you, it, there, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, it, we are adding another layer of bureaucracy that I don't know has to adhere to open meeting law. That would be maybe a question for is that. Um, Emily, do you know? Yes, it would have to, it's a, I think Beth called it a body politic yesterday. Right. So supervisory unions are public bodies and BOCES would be public bodies. Okay, so their meetings would have to be? Yes. Okay. And, oh. and they would be subject to um, public records laws. Those go hand in hand. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I guess I one of the reasons we're pushing BOCES is that it would have, like, it would immediately start to solve problems. And I'm not sure that's true. I think if we talk to folks in Windsor, I think they would say it was, it took time before they started seeing the, uh, fiscal benefits of the program. So I'm not sure it's a fast fix. It's probably, it is a fix. I would totally agree with my colleague that this is, I'm sure it reaps benefits over time, but I'm just wondering if it really is short-term um, help. Um, it would take a little while to get out. Probably, yeah. A year or so. A year or so. Um, I just, you know, we do a lot of studies in here, and I know people are tired of studies, but I wonder if a study would be uh, maybe not that that's probably too too much no studies um but it is going to be studied in the what are we calling this now the commission of the future of public education it is going to be studied but we have to add it i think it's in there already eight, eight, eight or seven. right i think it's already in but it's not it's i'm not referring to the bill i'm not referring to, referring to the section of the bill that talks about like the future of education um, I think there is a provision in here to talk about BOCES. Um, no, Emily probably doesn't know. She may not have seen this yet. Um, we should probably check that out. Anyway, all yeah, I'm saying is I'm still thinking of learning, and I haven't really made up my mind one way or another. Okay. Well, I guess it's, yeah. That's fair. It's only May. <laughs> yeah. I know. No, I know. It is, no it, we do have time. I mean, we would move this Go next on. week. We also do have uh, this section of the yield bill that does have a lot of stuff in it that we could, if people want to, alter it accordingly. And I did hear from Representative Conlon that approves made zero changes to that no, leverage. Okay. So I'm feeling we could move, start to move, look at this because even if they have a floor amendment or two, we can always just take that into can consideration. Can we have a walker? Yeah, we just have to wait. That's the finish that here there. Uh, okay. So, uh, Senator, please. Yeah, thanks, sir. So, so I haven't done a deep dive into HA 87, but it does speak in section one a lot about efficiencies, which is exactly what we're trying to address with both. So, mm -hmm. See, that's why I, I asked the question to Sims. But unfortunately, this is all really new to all of us, HA 87, but um, yeah, it requires a, us to kind of deep dive and see if there's unnecessary duplication. Okay. If everyone's comfortable, we'll ask Annie uh, uh, to ask Beth St. James to come in first thing on Tuesday. Beth St. James is our lawyer, same in the house said. Prior to uh, Secretary Saunders starting, we have about an hour before she gets in. She can take us through this. I know it's a lot. Okay. Might be busy on the floor doing the same bill. On Tuesday? Throughout the entire day. Give it a shot. Yes. Yeah. If you don't mind, Annie. Sweeten the deal if you need to. Um, we've got candy. Here we have got candy. We've got trophy. Maybe gone by now. Yeah, we all all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, because I'd like to be able to. We're gonna have to move the yield bill um, pretty quickly, which I have confidence to be able to do. So yeah, Senator, we just here is HA eighty seven. So where is it now? It's coming off of the House floor. So no, it's, no, it'll come out maybe tomorrow. 
If not tomorrow, Tuesday, it'll be on the floor, I think, on the Tuesday, Tuesday, on, the floor. Tuesday on the floor. So and I'm hoping to have, once we know when, we'll have, we should start our section ASAP with that, but then we'll have a joint hearing with finance, because there's some, I'm told, interplay between some of the other yield language and, and policy. So I, we'll get there. I know. Uh, and, you know, listen, the House put a lot of work into that first section, and there are things that we could, uh, people really feel, we want to put other studies or things, BOCES stuff, we, that's a possibility. I think it's up to all of you. I personally do see the benefit of the BOCES, um, and it'd be nice to get people an opportunity to get started if they want to get started. I know some of them, and maybe that's a question if we can ask Rep. Buss is how exactly did things get started without this bill? So. Yeah, um, if I may make a suggestion, maybe there is someone in Windsor County who could speak to what they've done and how they did it. Like, I don't know if they're maybe the, um, the business manager of that the district. I feel like we've heard from their, some of their superintendents a couple of times from in Windsor County. Yeah. What about OCs? Not, not about both seats, just, I, I just mean like they're responsive in general. Oh, like, oh, right, yeah. So they might be accessible to come and testify. So that might be helpful. Great. Okay. I, I know a little bit about Windsor County. <laughs> okay. okay. So Senator Gulick, and I'm, I'm inserting myself with four minutes to go. So Senator Gulick, I'm aware of a special education program run in Windsor County. Is that what you're thinking of? Okay. Yeah, that so is what I'm thinking of. Actually, in a few pockets of the state and um, in Essex, Westford, this year, supervisory unions use the current law about joint contracts. Um, it's Section 267 <laughs> yesterday to operate a collaborative special education program. So, yes, that is what they're doing. It's existing law. The current requirements are that they... Um, write up their plan for their agreement and get the Secretary of Education's approval to move forward on that joint agreement. So it's a contract among multiple supervisory unions. And similar to BOCES, there are those supervisory unions that are members of the agreement, and there are those that purchase services who are who are customers of the services of that joint agreement. Oh, thank you for that. Appreciate it. We'll move this next week or not. Uh, I don't think there's much else we would have to do. We would either incorporate it into what they want for the yield bill, or we would move the dates, or I think we've heard a lot of, I think we have a good sense of, and I'll leave back to Rep. Bus on the Windsor County folks to try to understand a little bit better. Tomorrow, if it's okay with everyone, I would love to move school construction uh, down our calendar. Okay. Yep. okay. Thanks, Ms. Simmons. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, no, I think we're okay. Um, are, are they ready? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it works for you. Yeah. Thanks, Annie. You're doing a heck of a job. Yeah. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> doing great. Doing great. We have your evaluation right here. Any <laughs> word? <laughs> We're a fun crowd most days. Is this one of those most Probably days? Fun. Huh. It is. We'll see how the next few hours go. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Little, uh, you know, we're having a three to team. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're thrilled you're here. Um, Everyone wants to be better, better early than later. I we appreciate that. It's a we're, we're very popular. Go loyal. There's Lyle. So everyone, we are now shifting gears. Uh, and I apologize, my papers are a little bit out of work because I was looking for an a older version of a bill. But this is regarding our Secretary of Education. Uh, and we have the nominating committee. I believe I have that correct. You'll all correct me. Um, Ms. Samuelson, Mr. Jepson, Ms. O'Farrell. Uh, and the committee, uh, first of all, thanks for making the time. 
Mr. Jetson, I don't know where you are, but it looks like maybe it's somewhere fun. Well, I, if you hear teenagers behind me, I apologize. I am in Houston right now at the first uh, robotics championship. And there are about 5,000 teenagers wandering around the uh, Brown Conference Center right now. So I apologize if there is background noise, uh, but Vermont is being very well represented by a team from Rutland County, and we're, we're very excited about that. That's terrific. Thank you. So um, other senators may want to uh, tee this up maybe better than I can or just jump in with questions. Uh, I know Senator Weeks raised a couple of questions about a week ago around process that you all went through um, to uh, uh, put forward the name of Secretary Saunders. Uh, I think we all just generally have some questions but it came out of actually the chair's meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago. I think it was Senator Kitchell that said, be good to hear from, again, correct me if I'm wrong, the nominating committee or the search committee to understand a little bit about your process, uh, why Ms. Saunders, uh, some background. And so I think I'll just turn it over to all of you, hear what you have to say, and then we'll jump in with questions. All right. Um, well, you guys have already heard from me. I'm happy to speak again, but you've got two other experts in the room, so I, I might defer to Lyle and Jenna and um, jump in as appropriate. Whatever you'd like. <laughs> Jenna, would you like to start or would you like me to start? Okay. Um, well, we did receive a charge back in, I think, as early as July, I think is when we got a letter from... Lyle, we're having a little problem hearing you. All right, is that any better? No. You can't hear me at all. We can hear you, it's just not that loud. How about now? We think your, your microphone might be attached to your laptop. It is. Just, is that now any better? It's getting there. And what we, um, if he goes to audio, the little arrow on the side of audio should allow him to select the audio source. Did you hear that? I am going to select audio source. Yes. Is that any better? A little bit. Yeah, I think we can hear you. Okay, because... well, I'm, I'm going to speak right up. So uh... oh, there we go. There we go. Now we've got you. All right, I'll stop yelling. All right. Okay. <laughs> so um, we received a charge from the governor back in July, and in that charge, she had a pretty clear focus about what yeah. he was uh, most interested in. He feels that the AOE should try. Oh, maybe shut his camera off. How's that? Lyle, we lost you. He needs to shut off his camera. If you can hear us. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay. I was having trouble zooming in, so I was on my phone, and now my computer is good. Um, so I'm happy to jump in. Or <laughs> Great. Um. So I, I think what Lyle was saying is we received the letter from the governor um, this summer, and I want to say it was at the end of July. And the way the board works, we can't, you know, operate unless we operate in public meeting as a body. So even though I received that letter in my capacity as chair at the end of July, um, I couldn't act on it until the board met. And I believe the August board meeting was August 9th. So that was when I brought the letter to the full board. And at that board meeting, we set up the secretary search committee. Um, so I was joined by Lyle and Jenna. I did include resumes. I mean, <laughs> maybe just as a point of information, because I think if you do look at, you know, particularly Lyle's resume and Jenna's resume, they bring an awful lot of educational experience that I thought, you know, in my capacity as chair would be really invaluable to be able to you know, read the resumes and really um, help to identify the the top candidates. 
So, so we, um, do, we do not have their resumes in front of us, but that okay. may be because our committee assistant is ill, but Annie will uh, dig into those uh, resumes. Okay. Um, basically, between Lyle and Jenna, we, we've got a few decades of really good experience in public schools in Vermont um, and you know, doing a variety of other um, jobs within that. But I think you know, both Jenna and Lyle have been principals of public schools um, for a number of years. Lyle also was the um, leader of the Stafford Technical Center for 14 years, Lyle. 16, yep. 16 years. Anyway, you know, pretty well qualified um, to be on the committee. So I was really happy um, to have them join the committee. Um, and Lyle, I just got to our August board meeting where we set up the committee so I can pass yeah. it back to you. <laughs> okay, my apologies. I don't know how long I'll be on. There are about 50,000 devices here. There are 55,000 people here. Um, so we got the charge from the governor. Um, I think I got cut off when I said that one of the issues he was in, interested in was after school and summer enrichment programs. And so we took uh, over 100 comments from the public at a public meeting, and we looked at what the governor was suggesting, what we also as a state board believe is important for a vision for education in the state of Vermont. And we took um, the governor's thoughts and those 100 comments and created questions. And from those questions, we then interviewed, um, I believe it was seven candidates. I believe there were 17 applications. 19. And then we forward 19, sorry. And then we forwarded three who we felt were qualified based on um, what not only the public was interested in, but what the governor was interested in. We then and to that, I would, did... I would just add statute, because um, the statute, we definitely <laughs> brought that into the job description and, and you know, use that as the lens by which we evaluated candidates. So it wasn't just what Jenna Lyle and Jennifer thought. Um, now, I, I'd kind of like to just cut to the chase because I don't know how long I'm going to be able to stay with the Wi-Fi. Uh, well, um, Senator Hashim has a question. Yes, sir. Just a quick question. Can you tell me when uh, you sent the names up to the governor? It was after our November 15th full board meeting. <laughs> So, so November 16th or? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I could go back and look at my email. It may have been the afternoon of November 15th. I believe I had a phone call with the governor's office the afternoon of November 15th. And it might have been that the paperwork didn't go out till the 16th, but. Thank you. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Now, good question. Lyle, please go ahead. I think there are three things that I hear um, people talking about um, regarding uh, so one of which is a lack of teaching experience in public education. Another is her charter schools experience. And the other seems to be some notion of closing schools um, that she's participated in. Um, I have to tell you right up front that during the, the questioning, and we had about, I don't know, 15 questions, I'm looking at them now. Um, we did not talk about charter schools and we did not talk about closing schools because that was not the position she was applying for. She's applying for a public education position. Sorry, Lyle. As much as we we want to be patient with you, we, we just, it's a little hard. Well, and I'll just keep going. Okay. Can you hear us? So, I can hear you. So we need to ask what I think it's a camera issue. Lyle. Lyle, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear okay, me? we're having some difficulty. We appreciate you being here, but frankly, it's very distracting because you're sort of in and out. I wonder if maybe something, maybe if you shut your camera off, it'll help. Uh, it's still very hard to hear you, though. I'm back. And Lyle, I think it was better when you were holding the microphone up under your mouth. Okay, well, it's under my mouth now. <laughs> so we looked at looked at those three things, and okay. we did not talk about charter schools because, again, that was not the, the position she was applying for. She's applying for a public school position. We did not talk about closing schools. We talked about leadership. We talked about tech ed. We talked about enrichment programs. We talked about the skills that she could bring to the position, which from a, a letter we received and then follow-up conversations with references, 
uh, Daniel Gold from Hewlett Packard, he's the head of U.S. Ed, um, education strategy, pointed out that she's uh, exemplary at bringing public-private partnerships together, where she brought uh, corporations together to help fund um, opportunities in public education, including a tech ed program, which was an aviation program that she started, which uh, really made us feel good about her, her CTE uh, interest. Um, so we looked at the qualities that we need in the state of Vermont. We looked at the qualities she brings to the position. We felt there was a match. Now, we also felt there was a match for two other people. So there were three people that were sent to the governor, not just Zoe. The governor chose, chose Zoe, and I absolutely concur with that as a choice. Other references, and I went, went through them, highlighted things like her ability to plan strategically, her ability to evaluate programming, her communication skills, which they say are exemplary, and her ability to, to design and implement uh, strategies and programs. One other person suggested that she has an exceptional talent for leading cross-functional teams, which is something that the governor talked about, where he wants school systems to work very closely with the Agency of Human Services. He talked about her dedication to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is something that we've been working hard on as a State Board of Education as we've gone through Rule 2000 series and 2200 series, doing a relay of both of those. So as we went through, we scored all these candidates and she scored very well. And we used a, a matrix, a scoring matrix that the three of us filled out and it worked uh, out that she was one of the top three candidates. I'll pause there. Many questions for Mr. Jeps. In our weeks, all the for, oh, I'm serious. I, I'm getting there. I'm formulating questions in my mind. Okay. Um, while, I, I have one. Sorry, while you're doing that, okay. Annie, would you ask Morgan for those resumes? Sure, straight away? The yeah. sure. I, I mean, one question that I just looking at the um, dates. Do you is there any sense of why the governor waited from March to July to send the letter? Or is that not something that he shared? That is not something he shared. I think you'd have to ask the governor's office. I think he did allude to it, perhaps in the letter that he sent, saying that he knew he was going to be preoccupied with the flooding that had just taken place in the summer. And that, I'm sure, took up considerable time on his part um, and continues to this day. Um, as you all know, bills are going through to support continued flood uh, remediation. Uh, yes, in our weeks. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, it's in our sheet. Oh, you, you go ahead. Laurie, it's for it. Uh... Yeah, no, what's a good burning battery? Oh, well, okay, so I really want to listen more than I want to talk. But I'll, I'll go. So Lyle and, and um, the same as said, Ms. O'Farrell, uh, was part of the questioning in the um, in the uh, interview process, What were you, uh, did you, um, inquire if the candidates, all three candidates, or all seven candidates, I, I guess, uh, had a, a good understanding of the challenges of Vermont's public education system. Absolutely. And I, I have to tell you, uh, David, um, she knows more about, she being Zoe, knows more about um, state education system than I do. And I feel you know, I was in it for 30 years. Um, she has she's very well researched uh knew what our problems were and had suggestions i, I would echo that um I, I think that was the one one of the things that i really noticed during our interview with her is she had clearly done her research on vermont and we asked a, a few different questions sort of talking about um you know, leadership style, it, you know, issues that she identified in Vermont, you know, what she might do, you know, how she sort of envisioned the job. Um, we, we had several, you know, questions that were specific to Vermont. And again, I think we all felt that she 
answered them um, well. So the, the direct question was, what are the greatest challenges facing education in Vermont and what steps would you take to resolve them? Uh, and we should follow, follow, follow up, I could. so I, I appreciate that. Are you willing to offer any of the, the challenges that she specifically raised and addressed in her interview process that gave you the confidence that she was well-researched or that her background fit the necessary profile? Well, and let me just interrupt um, because I do realize that this is covered by executive privilege and I'm not sure that it's our privilege to waive. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Senator Hashim. Well, I imagine this may be under executive privilege as well, but uh, you had mentioned that uh, she has experience with designing and implementing strategies, programs. Uh, are you able to share what some of those are as it relates to public schools prior to November 15th? She had yeah. talked. Well, we, will, we do have her in on Tuesday, so we have an opportunity uh, to talk to her directly, of course. But please go ahead, Ms. Anderson. Well, I was going to say, Lyle, I don't, is Lyle still with us? Lyle might have fallen off. Um, she, and I'm sorry, Senator Hashim, could you please repeat your question? Yeah, no, no problem. It, it was something that Lyle had raised, uh, but uh, I think it was designing and implementing strategies and programs. Uh, and so I was just wondering what some of those might have been as it relates to public schools, at least prior to uh, setting the name up. So Lyle, I don't know if you want to answer that or I can go through my notes or Jenna. You're just going to get rid of me, sorry. Um, <laughs> why don't you take that one? I'm going to turn my camera off. So I'm just, I'm looking through my notes. Um, she mentioned, you know, she's got a track record of increasing school enrollment and academic performance. Um, as the um, CEO for the city of Fort Lauderdale, she launched a new division focusing on improving education for 180,000 residents. Um, worked on a, worked with a technical college and aeronautical partners to design a training to employment pipeline. Um, also oversaw high yield out of school programs. And, and frankly, here, here's a really good example of um, one of the things that I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you about, but she was talking that they got money, the city of Fort Lauderdale got money after COVID for um, after school programs. And at the time, the program was a half day program during the summer. And one of the things that she realized was that a barrier to entry for kids to participate in that program was that it was only a half a day. And most students who needed this program had parents who worked full days. And so the kids who you know arguably needed that program the most were the very ones who weren't able to access it. So she was able to you know, secure an alternate source of funding. And I'm sure she will correct me on this because this was, you know, I'm working off memory from five months ago, um, but she was able to find additional funding to turn it into a full day program so that the students could access it. Um, so that was one example. The other thing too, that she mentioned that she was working with Parks and Recs and there was an educational component to this program and Parks and Recs was really uncomfortable with the program. And she drilled down and worked with them and said, you know, where where is this resistance coming from? And what she realized was that their issue was that they didn't have any experience um, creating educational programs for kids. And so what she told the committee was at that point, that was an easier problem to fix because, you know, it's, it, the way she framed it, and again, I like this example of how to reframe an issue to get people to buy in, was this is all about kids. This is about improving student outcomes. What can we do to leverage resources to allow students to get into this program so that they can do better. And she was able to execute that. Thank you. And you probably just said it, Jennifer, but she had a, a COVID grant um, and worked in the summertime with a particular group of students that needed math and reading enrichment. Um, so she was able to reach during a period of the summer about 2,000 students in Fort Lauderdale um, and brought their, their scores up. Um, during that period of time. Yeah, 
against the center layers. So one of the criteria you evaluated was uh, leadership. Can you tell me what what particularly uh, impressive about her response to that? Lyle or Jenna, or I can jump in. <laughs> Well, I'm looking back at oh, the here? folks that we talked to. One of the things that they said she did very well was she was able to connect with um, the city, um, state and federal uh, leaders to bring resources to um, to the to her area. Um, and that she was able to leverage the skills of people around her. Um, and it, it the example I, I keep using when I talk about her is that it sounds to me like we don't need an astronaut to run NASA, that we need someone who can get the astronauts to Mars and back. And the sense we got throughout our conversation with her and with others was that she has an innate skill at bringing the leadership of other people together around a joint mission. And that sounded a whole lot like the military to me, quite frankly, Terry. Um, but it sounded like she was the type of leader that could bring disparate schools all around the state together with their disparate leadership and pull in the same direction. Thank you. And I would just add to that, I think she spoke of a couple of different examples of really being able to work with different organizations and um, really getting buy-in from you know different constituents to be able to um, execute. Um, and she also, you know, she has experience working with administrators, teachers, subject matter experts, government entities, um, you know, other organizations. I mean, she seemed to have a lot of familiarity with what felt to me relevant in terms of thinking about what the Secretary of Agent, the Secretary of Education would be required to do. Uh, Senator Gula, please. Thank you. Um, instead of asking questions about what you ask, because um, I know some of that's probably an executive session, and we can ask for those questions. So I will I will um, keep those for Tuesday. I want to know a little bit more about the process. Hmm. Uh, how much money did you spend on this search? So I can take this one, because I've heard a lot about that, um, and I'm, I'm sure you have too. We spent $500. Um, but let me frame this for you. Um, I also reached out to the financial administrator at the Agency of Education who went back to FY13 just for purposes of comparison to see how much the board has spent advertising previous job vacancies. And what I can tell you is that when the board still oversaw what was then the Department of Education, the board spent, it, it, and she went back to FY13. So that was the last year, FY13, that the board spent any money advertising age um, positions. It was a little over $11,000, but that was when the board oversaw the department. Since FY13, the board, according to her research, has spent $0 on advertising. So what that means to me is that there were no expenditures for Rebecca Holcomb. There were no expenditures for Dan French. And the other thing that I have to say is when Secretary French notified people last spring that he was leaving. You know, we knew that at some point we were going to have to engage in a secretary search. I think probably the General Assembly also realized that we would have to do that. There was no funding given to the State Board of Education to engage in that. Um, when I look at the budget that was passed in Act 78, um, the State Board of Education was given, you know, a little over $70,000 for personal services and operating expenses. So, we, did, we weren't given money <laughs> to conduct the search that I think people maybe thought we sh should conduct. But that said, I feel confident, and I think you guys should feel confident, in the search that was performed. We advertised, we received 19 applicants. That's five more applicants than the last search that culminated in Dan French. Um, we had applicants from four states, uh, and they were not contiguous states. I mean, obviously, Florida's not contiguous, but... Um, you know, other states as well, we felt that we had a good cross-section. We could have extended the search. We could have chosen to um, 
you know, ex expand our advertising. And as a committee, we felt that we had a really good selection of applicants from which to pull interview and then ultimately select three um, qualified candidates for the governor. So I'll, I'll have you follow up. Um, so, I mean, it just seemed to, from my point of view, uh, $500 for a secretary of education search in a time where we are, uh, a lot of folks call it in a crisis mode, um, and where we are looking for a person to oversee a $2.6 billion budget um, with a lot of complexity that will affect multiple generations of future Vermonters. It just $500 seems sad to me. I'll, I'll leave that at that. Um, you mentioned that you advertise. Can you expand on that a little bit? Where did you advertise and what did the advertising look like? So I've sent to the committee twice now a copy of the job description that we crafted. Um, so you should have that in your packet. And I've also included um, the slideshow that I also provided in January, whenever it was that I came to talk about the secretary search. I think it was in January. Um, I can pull that information up again if you give me just a moment. We have we do have the job description in our folders. Um, okay. Um, I think Senator Buick might be looking for, correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Buick. What is the ad? I mean, was this what was put out, this job description? Is this what was sort of advertised? I believe it was, um, but it was the Office of Human Resources that okay. did the, the advertising for us. So we'd have to talk to them to get specifics on where the advertising went. Well, no, I can tell you, I'm pulling that up right now. Um, the position was advertised in Success Factors, School Spring, Education Week, Facebook, LinkedIn, Diversity Jobs, Indeed, Glassdoor, Career Builder, and an Agency of Education press release. Uh, Senator Hashim. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, for the application, did you receive references? Did you talk to them? And did you get positive, neutral, or negative feedback? We did receive references. The Se Secretary Search Committee did not reach out. We left that to the governor's office. Do you know if they reached out? I do not. You'd have to ask them. Thank you. So you, I think, act a Wait. little bit. Um, um, yeah, please. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I just want to confirm what I heard. So. Uh, the name was sent up prior to contacting any references? Correct. And again, keep in mind that if the governor had not been satisfied with the candidates, he had the ability to reject them all, send us back, send it back to us, tell us to conduct another search. Um, you know, it wasn't like he was stuck with three people that he felt were not qualified. I think <laughs> we we thought the three candidates were very well qualified. We picked the top three, sent those off to the governor. Um, and from there, he made his decision. But he definitely had the ability to disagree with us if he had wanted to. Were the references for the other applicants reached out to? Um, the governor's office, you would have to ask the governor's office, but any contact with references would have been done by the governor's office. And we did submit the entire application packet for each of those three candidates to the governor's office, which included references. In, in, in the past, have has the State Board of Education reached out to references, or is that 100% in the governor's office uh, for this process? I don't know, honestly. There's no record at all of the secretary search that culminated in Rebecca Holcomb being named secretary. Um, and with regard to the search that culminated in Dan French being named secretary, we, the committee, you know, have access to all of the meeting minutes, um, but there's no record of whether um, that, there's no, there's nothing in the minutes to indicate that that committee reached out to references. So, sorry, last, last please, question. Please, um, please. So, do you have the discretion to reach out to references before you send a name up? We probably could have, yes. Okay. That's it. Thank you. It, it's, it's great line of questioning because I was about to compare, Senator Hashim and I serve on judicial nominating and judicial nominating uh, the 10 of us roughly, before we send the names up to the governor, 
we call references. Am I correct though in understanding you didn't call references, but you did have written references or no references at all? And you just send the names out. No, we had written references and, and we did read those. And I mean, frankly, one of the things that we really relied on quite heavily when we were conducting the search was this um, booklet that has been pre prepared by the um, Vermont Department of Human Resources called A Guide to Interviewing Reference Checking. So I will be honest, in that booklet, um, it mentions that references are of somewhat limited value because obviously, you know, if you think about it, someone's going to put down a name as a reference, a person who is probably going to say nice things about them. And so what becomes a little bit hard is how to ferret out. Um, <laughs> you know, you're, you're only going to get a reference that is going to say nice things about a person. Um, so we felt like there was limited utility in tracking that down. And, and to be honest, we don't have that capacity. The governor's office did. And so as we thought about it, and you know, Lyle and Jenna, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the governor's office, because again, the governor is ultimately going to be the one making that decision. It felt like something that they were better capable at doing. And so we gave that um, responsibility to them. And if I misspoke and said we talked to someone, I was looking at the references, the physical references that we, we saw. And that's what I was uh, referencing when I talked about what people said. Senator Williams. So did, uh, did you do them by video teleconference or was there any in-person uh, and were they all done the same way? The yes. Interviews? The interviews, yeah. Yeah, so each interview was an hour and 15 minutes long. Each interview um, had 15 questions. Lyle, Jenna, and I were each responsible for our own questions. So we were very consistent about, you know, who asked which questions and what the question was that was asked so that each candidate could be um, fairly compared to other candidates. Um, and they were all done through um, the Teams link. And we did them, I believe, over the course of three days, I want to say, seven interviews in three days, so that it was all kind of fresh in our minds. Just to follow up, did you have anybody that originally applied withdraw? No, not that I know of. Thank you. So once you determine your, just in terms of process, does it go to the full state board at some point or does it go to all of, it's the three of you then move to the governor's office just for clarity? No, we met with the full state board at the board's monthly meeting on November 15th and shared with the full board um, the entire application packet for all seven candidates whom we had interviewed. So that included, you know, their cover letter, their resume, letters of recommendation, um, our scoring rubric, the questions that we were asked, you know, how Lyle scored a candidate, how Jenna scored the candidate, how I scored the candidate, and what the average um, combined score was amongst the three of us for each of the candidates. So we went through this whole process in executive session with the full board, took questions about, you know, different candidates, different aspects of different candidates. Um, and when we came out of executive session, we voted as a board unanimously um, to advance three names to the governor. Okay, uh, Senator Gill. Thank you, Chair. You, Lyle, you said that you didn't, the, the subject of charter schools didn't come up in your conversation or in your interview or in the uh, assessment of the candidates. And you did mention statutory requirements. Can you speak a little bit more about those statutory requirements and what exactly you were looking for and looking at? I think Jennifer suggested the statutes. Um, so there are, oh, specific, okay. yeah, there are specific items that um, by statute, we expect the secretary to be able to do the duties that that person would perform. Um, so within that, it really, has a lot to do with working with others, working with other agencies, working um, on strategic planning. Um, we felt she had those those uh, characteristics. Um, Jennifer, did you want to add to that? Sure. So I'm I'm quoting from three VSA section twenty seven oh two paragraph C, 
It says, at the time of appointment, the secretary shall have expertise in education management and policy and demonstrated leadership and management abilities. The duties of the secretary are laid out in 16 VSA section 212. And I won't read that because it is over two pages long, <laughs> but I did include that link with your materials. Thank you. Yes, we have, uh, we have it as well uh, earlier in the week. Um, my only other yeah, thing is we so haven't we haven't heard from Jenna and she's been on the screen this whole time. I'm wondering if she wants to say anything. Uh, Lyle and Jennifer attested to everything that our, our process and how we went about um, interviewing candidates and scoring candidates and um, following. I think we were trying to. Um, really respect and honor what sits in statute and what the governor had laid out in his letter when formulating the job posting and looking for preferred qualifications. Okay, thanks. And Ms. O'Farrell, where were you a, a principal? St. Johnsbury. Oh, which school? St. Johnsbury. No, St. Johnsbury School. Oh, this school, the elementary school? Correct. We have one school, pre K through E3. Got it. In St. John's Bridge. Yep. Very helpful. Committee, any other questions? Uh, again, we're hearing from the, uh, Secretary Saunders on Tuesday, but this is helpful to know the process. There have been a lot of questions, uh, it, no fault of anyone. This just happens to be a uh, a secretary position that has uh, been in the news a lot, uh, their candidacy, the role has been elevated for a number of reasons. And it's just helpful also to know the process. Let's set Secretary Saunders aside, frankly. Some of the process is information that's new to me, even having been in this building for 14 years. And, and it's interesting and, and important for all of us to know. So from that is, I really appreciate it as well. And thank you. And I mean, it's helpful for us to get this feedback. Um, you know, when we started this process, obviously none of us had ever done a secretary search before. So, I mean, again, we relied heavily on the secretary search that had been done for Dan French. And then to that, we added to it. You know, we threw in um, the public comment hearing, which I think we all thought was really, really helpful. And I hope the, the public also felt like they had an opportunity to um, have it effect on our um, selection process. We took those comments very seriously, you know, wove those comments into the questions that we had asked the candidates. So, you know, that was one thing, you know, I, all I can say is we tried to improve on what had happened before us. And I'm sure if it happens again, we'll try to improve on what we did this time. But I, I think overall, we felt like it was a good process that um, resulted in um, identifying some really qualified candidates. Yeah, I, I just... Oh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the public uh, process for input? Sure. Although, Jenna, did you want to? Uh, I just say... wanted to add that I, I think there is a real opportunity in for legislators to really look at what the secretary's duties are and the preferred qualifications, how we were, how we put those in the job posting and really think moving forward, um, does this accurately reflect what um, the secretary experience and roles and responsibilities should be moving forward. So thank you. And Ms. Samuelson, uh, Senator Williams, just, and it's a great question I was going to ask as well. So you heard from about a hundred, you had a public hearing where people came in and what did they, what was sort of the prompt question? Was it, what do you, what do you want to see in a secretary or? Yes. Yeah, so we had, and we had, well, I'll back up. I think we had 11 secretary search committee meetings. And of course, because this is state board of ed, every meeting is warm and open to the public. We had public comment at every meeting. Well, we had the opportunity for public comment. We didn't necessarily receive public comment at every meeting, um, but we did have the opportunity for public comment. In addition to that, we held a public comment hearing, I believe on October 2nd about the qualities and attributes that people um, wanted to see in the next Secretary of Education. 
And in connection with that, I do know that um, the VSBA, VPA, and VSA all sent out to their constituents a two-question survey that they um, then compiled that information. And they, they basically gave us you know, the raw data, the, the answers that they received from 100 different um, principal superintendents, teachers. Um, and then appended to that was sort of the... Um, four sort of high level things that um, Jay Nichols on behalf of all three organizations submitted to the board about what they thought was important. Um, so we looked at all of that information, um, you know, whatever had come in at our meetings and public comments, as well as the public comment hearing, as well as the information that was compiled um, by the three organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you all did an incredible amount of work. There's no question about that. 11 hearings, 11 meetings, public hearing, uh, creating the job description, all that. So, so please, uh, personally, thank you for all of that work. Uh, we know that you're getting about a buck 50 an hour if you're lucky. Uh, Lyle, you might be getting a little bit more, I don't know. Uh, but, but we certainly, I certainly just want to express my gratitude for that incredible, it, it's a heavy lift. Mr. Jackson, your, your hand was up. Well, I want to thank Jennifer who really guided that process and Jennifer for the amount of time she took. Um, and I want to apologize to you all for being in and out of this meeting. It's not my general mode of operation. And I don't think David and Harry have ever seen me without a tie. So this is your opportunity. Oh, no. <laughs> it, may never, it may never happen again. So, uh, and do know that we have world-class kids in Vermont. There are 640 teams here from around the world at this robotics competition. There are 60 nations represented, and New England has a whole lot of teams. Vermont has one, and uh, we're going to win. So I hope. Thank you for uh, letting us be here today. Yeah, and, thank you. Senator Yeah, Hampton. Thank yeah thank uh, Mr. Jefferson, I'm just looking. Uh, how long were you the director? I mean, you're. Uh, I've met you in passing, but you're pretty legendary in the Rutland area. I think I keep trying to get you to run for Senate. Um, how long were you at the Career Technical Institute, uh, career at the Stafford Center? Stafford Center for 16 years. Prior to that, I was at Fair Haven High School as principal there for and assistant principal for seven years. Um, I was an elementary principal, a teacher. Um, basically, when I talk about my resume, my wife reminds me that maybe it's because I couldn't hold a job. And so I just kept moving around. But I tried one of everything except uh, secretary, and you wouldn't want me there, so. <laughs> no, I'm looking at it now. OK. Any other questions for uh, our guests? Good. OK. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Afternoon. Good luck down there, Lyle. Thank you. Thank you for what all you do. It's a lot yeah. of time. Take care. I have to Joe Chase. Who's Joe Chase? He's a robot guy. Oh, really? Okay. Let's just take five minutes and then we'll move on to Mr. Little. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and committee members, Tom Little, with Vermont Student Assistance. Corporation uh, coming here to talk with you about H874 is passed by the House and supplementing prior testimony. I shared with the committee um, a brief memo that contains a, I guess, a tentatively proposed substitute language for Section 8. Um, I have had uh, over the last day or so, some additional correspondence with uh, my primary contact at the National Guard, uh, who is Brigadier General Henry Carter, hey, Carter. Uh, Hank. And he su uh, suggested that you may have heard from uh, Major General um, Greg Gregory uh, Knight about the same issue about whether or what this text should look like or does it whether it needs to be there at all. And I wanted to know if you know whether you've heard from uh, General Knight 
If not, we reached out to General Knight. I believe Mr. Feldman did. Um, we can reach out to him again. But I think that uh, please, uh, uh, we'll have to send I will offer that um, the National Guard Veterans Administration and Caucus uh, received some correspondence. Uh, okay. That wasn't uh, for the committee. It was just pressing some such. So it, the, the, it, it may be that the, the guard leadership has um, evolved its position on this. And I guess I would encourage you to continue to try to connect with uh, General Knight or General Harder. But be that as it may, um, um, we want to do this as collaboratively as we can and with proposed language that VSAC thinks would be more manageable uh, in terms of administering it in the context of the VSAC programs and would still capture the intent of the original proposers of the language, which I think is, comes from House Bill 739, something like that. That was the section eight was pulled from that house bill and put under the miscellaneous end bill. And it's on in uh, the italics in the first page of my memo. And I uh, were also proposing to move it from a separate part of the VSAC chapter into the National Guard chapter. Um, and I've we produced that chap sub chapter with this proposed substitute language at the end, so you have the context of it. Uh, and that's our that's uh, my testimony, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer questions or engage in a dialogue with the committee. Yeah, no, I appreciate this. Uh, so, what were your concerns again with the initial language proposed? That might be. There were there were two, I guess. One, this uh, came as surprise to VSAC that uh, it's a surprise to VSAC that the proposal to to put this in a statute um, suggested to us that people thought that we were. Refusing to do this or weren't doing it. Refusing to do what? Just so we put all, yeah. to put um, military, national guard, yeah. and military related post secondary options into our counseling and financial aid materials or publications, which you have been doing. Which we have been doing. Mm -hmm. There also turned out to be some confusion between two. Um, mm -hmm two events that VSAC has historically participated in. One is, is a series that, that are actually hosted by high schools, secondary schools, called Paying for College. And those are relatively small um, sessions where VSAC counselors are invited in by the high school to speak to students and parents. The high school is the host. Um, we BSAC hosts some college, we used to call them college affairs. I, I think there's a better name for it now, um, around the state um, with remote options, with in person. Uh, and those, uh, we invite the, the, the colleges and universities of Vermont and the National Guard and others to set up a table and be available to talk to people who show up. Um, uh, there was some confusion, I think, that the that, that VSAC had somehow disinvited the guard from those in high school paying for college mm -hmm. sessions and was, wasn't the case. Uh, I think um, the guard has been frustrated in some cases with um, lack of uh, an arms abrasive approach at some high schools or among some high school guidance counselors. We haven't had that experience, but we wouldn't have had that experience. That was 
one of the concerns is that what what was what prompted the 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 perception that this was needed in the first place. The second was the text, the language of of the of the legislative proposal, which you know, was um, using the word all twice, all military related options and all planning resources to produce. There are some publications and web resources that just wouldn't make a lot of sense, if any sense, to include these in um, because they're more tailored for a specific um, career path or um, demographic. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony a week ago, we uh, are, are actively working now with the National the Vermont National Guard to find ways and places we can <clears throat> enhance the references that we're already making uh, to the Guard programs. And they're likewise, they've, you pointed out to them, they have some publications and resources that are out of date. Um, on their own website, so we're we're working together on that. But that's that's it. We we felt that um, no one had come to us saying um, being uh, with any concerns about what we were currently doing. And the timing of this was such that the the House Education Committee was under get down to the wire for crossover and put that section off of the mis miscellaneous ed bill, we didn't have a chance to come in and testify in front of the House Committee. And we decided to we start the discussion over here. Uh, Senator Is it uh, fair to say, thank you, Chair, oh, sorry. Um, is it fair to say, uh, former member Little, uh, that you find this language a little too prescriptive? Or? That's another way to, yes, another way to put it. And our, the italicized alternative, um, we think, would give us the the guidance, but also the flexibility to put information about National Guard and U.S. Armed Forces resources in the right place, the logical place for students. And we 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 do maintain this distinction that. Um, you, I think, you pointed out previously, Senator Bullock, that we don't offer a recruiting function for the Guard or the U.S. Armed Forces or for any other particular path or career. We provide you know, the financial aid and counseling resources that maybe supplement that or provide a base for people to get the confidence to pursue those. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. No. Just a quick comment. I, I appreciate these, these recommendations. I get to exactly what I was also concerned about, and I think it's a bit more. Uh, this new language just makes more sense in my opinion. So, great club, Senator Williams. And so, no, I just. Um, so, are you saying if we did a strike all amendment with these, put this language in, that would take a uh, they will all do with what comes to right Oh, that'd be good. Because we're saying strike all the words. Just, all it's just taking in two one subsection out of the bill yep. and putting this language in its place. It's, it should be relatively okay. sur surgical. Like the request okay. is, however, if you um, if you can hear from the guard leadership and ask them have they have they reconsidered their concern about this or not, and we'll we'll we'll. we'll We'll roll with it either way. Thank you. Well, to that point, um, has uh, have any of your contacts with the Vermont National Guard seen the new language and have they fed back any kind of? Well, I shared it. I, I worked this up yesterday when I sent it over to the committee, and then I yesterday afternoon I sent it to uh, Brigadier General Harder, and he responded this morning. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. Uh, and then he said he would and did share an email that Major General Knight had sent to Representative Hango um, about H 874 in this regard. Um, 
and federal harvest at OAC with the state house this afternoon as I'm testifying at the House Government Operations and Military Affairs S310, which is unrelated to this matter. But um, he did not comment on the proposed substitute language yet. Can you get General Carter in tomorrow, please? Um, given, uh, you know, given challenges of updating IT systems and, and print material with the effective date of July 1, 2024, is that possible from your perspective? Well, I think that since we've already been doing a lot of this, um, I don't think this is an I, I think this is more of a content question mm -hmm. about them. It's the, the print stuff takes, is actually has a much longer lease time. To, and we have, we like to use up what we've got on the shelves before we print new stuff. But the, 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 somewhat sometimes, I hate to say this as the son of someone who was a father who was a printer, but I'm not sure how much the printed stuff gets used anywhere except by people like her. <laughs> but, um, so we, I'm not too worried about the July one day. And, it would, and, and if, you know, if the guard decides they don't think they need any language at all, then mm -hmm. that just goes away. Okay. Thank you for your time. Good thank luck. you. Thanks. Good luck in the next little while. Uh, uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Spoken from experience. Thank you. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> when we had, one of my sessions, we went into the second week of June. Oops. Oh, yeah. yeah exactly. Did you really? Yeah. Is that civil year? There was no, no. This was a fight over school funding. Oh, no right. way. Not Act 60. No, it was pre Act 60. Yeah, pre Act 60. It was my second, uh, Ralph Wright's sec last session as a speaker. Do you keep on, do you ever hear from Ralph? Yeah, I do. Good. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.